Good afternoon and welcome to the Pharmaceuticals in the Environment session of the FIAM Forum. Uh, my name is Stefan Constantinescu. I am president of FIAM and I will try in a few minutes to introduce you to our organization, the Federation of European Academies of Medicine and to its forum that organizes the meeting today. Um, the Federation of European Academies of Medicine um, is composed of 23 national academies of medicine and of sciences all across Europe. Um, we have in fact 14 academies of medicine. Um, we have uh, two academies of veterinarian science, one of pharmacy and um, six academies of sciences that have sections of medicines in countries that don't have um, academies of medicine. And the Federation of the European Academies of Medicine works together in a European consortium called SAPIA, European Commission Scientific Advice Mechanism um, for Policy by European Academies, where we uh, sit together with ISAC, ALEA, uh, Eurocase, which is the collection of academies of engineering, um, and the Academia Europea in a group of 100 academies in Europe that provide uh, evidence reports to the College of Commissioners of the European Commission. And our evidence reports are submitted also to the chief scientific advisors that would issue recommendations based on our, um, on our reports. Now, the, the missions of the FIAM uh, for medical academies overlap with those of SAPIA for all academies in Europe. And those are to provide the best scientific advice for European uh, Union policy, to connect academies of network across Europe, to promote the role of science in policy making, and to actually develop concrete cooperation between academy networks and the civil society and the, and the European uh, institutions. Now, the, the Federation of European Academies of Medicine created a European Biomedical Policy Forum as a platform for discussion of key policy issues in the biomedical community. So we aim to bring together representatives from um, all biomedical sectors coming from academia, from research uh, foundations, charities, industry, associations, non-governmental organizations, professional bodies, regulators, public health and bodies, patient and consumer groups. So you can see here the 27 current members. This is growing every day. It's going up quite quickly. We have a lot of uh, organizations that are academic like Cancer Research UK charities, EORTC, but also companies and non-governmental um, organizations. And so today we are approaching an extremely important project the pharmaceuticals in the environment. I would like to particularly uh, say that this is co-sponsored by the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe and by the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, IFPIA. And I'd like to, to thank the participants and especially uh, Professor Jean-Christophe Giard, which um, represents the French Academy of Pharmacy and it's the lead expert from FIAM on One Health and uh, my microbial antibiotic resistance. I would like to also uh, list here uh, the, the, the participants and I am personally grateful and on behalf of the FIAM board, I would like to thank everyone involved um, for uh, putting together this event, which I think will provide a very interesting view on the problem and would be a source for future research and especially for future policy issues. Now, for any questions, you, you can address them to, to the FIAM at this email address, but also directly to Dr. Elisa Corritore, who is organizing the event today. And with that, I wish you success and look forward for, to a very, very interesting forum meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, so we can now move to the first panel of, um, uh, of speaker, uh, dealing with the broader policy perspectives of pharmaceuticals in the environment. 
And uh, let me now introduce uh, our first speaker with uh, Sara Serdas, and she's a medical doctor from Portugal and member of the European Parliament. And uh, she's member of the Committee on, on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety and a co-chair in the European Parliament's Health Working Group. I'll choose the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you very much uh, for, to the Federation for the invitation and for organizing such an important event in, in quite one of the most important topics we have ongoing with a great emphasis in the One Health approach and highlighting the importance of health in our policies. So I will briefly begin my, my, my intervention. Um, as you know, we have found out that several pharmaceuticals uh, are in the surface and groundwater, soils and animal tissues across the EU. And these are uh, specifically, we're talking about antimicrobials, antidepressants, contraceptives, antiparasitics, which uh, are substances that are commonly found and widely known for their effect on the environment, among other uh, pharmaceuticals. For example, we have that male fish exposed to the hormones of contraceptive pills may become feminized, affecting their capacity, sorry, uh, affecting their capacity to reproduce. In other studies, uh, fish that were exposed to certain antidepressants have been found to change their behavior in ways that could affect their survival. So here we are talking about um, a very important biodiversity and uh, environmental challenge. And of course, one of the main challenges that we have now in public health, which is the presence of antimicrobial pharmaceutical substances in water and soil, which combined with the inappropriate use of antimicrobials, particularly in livestock farming, will play an important role in accelerating the development of antimicrobial resistance, which is one of the biggest pandemics we are going through. Unfortunately, the true impacts on human health are yet to be enlightened, as further research is needed to understand and evaluate certain pharmaceuticals in regards to their environmental concentrations and the resulting levels of risk. So this has to do with the risk exposure and more research should be focused on that. We have, and I believe the next speaker will, will tackle on this topic, we have that on March 2019, the Commission adopted a strategic approach to pharmaceuticals in the environment, which uh, reflects the work towards uh, that the EU is developing towards a sustainable Europe by 2030. And it will contribute in particular to achieving the sustainable development goal six, specifically on clean water and sanitation. The strategic approach to pharmaceuticals in the environment is clearly complemented by several other documents that follow the EU framework. For instance, the European One Health Action Plan against antimicrobial resistance, the new industrial strategy for Europe, chemical strategy for sustainability, and the strategy on endocrine disruptors. In this regard, I would like to highlight what the European Parliament has been developing, which is we have presented a resolution, meaning a European Parliament's position, recalling that the OECD latest report on pharma residues in freshwater can be found with that the current policy approaches to manage pharmaceutical residues are inadequate for the protection of water quality and freshwater ecosystems upon which healthy lives depend. And also reminding that pharmaceuticals authorized for human use and put on the market before 2006 were not subject to any environmental risk assessment as part of the authorization process. We also have that the European Parliament has also shared their concern on the soft nature of the measures included in the communication, calling for effective measures to mitigate the negative impacts of pharmaceuticals in the environment. We also stress that in order to ensure the effectiveness of regulatory actions, it is of the utmost importance that they are taken in line with the precautionary principle in mind and the principle that environmental dam damage should, as a priority, be rectified at source. Uh, 
Excuse me, uh, there's a small problem with the slides. Can you share the slides again? Because we don't see the slides. There, there are no slides. Oh, there, there are no slides, slides Stefan. No, uh, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. Uh, if I could carry on and just briefly uh, going towards the end of the presentation or the remarks, sorry, not the presentation, is that at the end of 2020, the Commission adopted a pharmacy strategy for Europe, a pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. And here there is a revision of the EU general pharmaceutical legislation that is set to be uh, adopted by the end of this year, simultaneously with the chemicals legislation, which is the revision of rich regulation to help achieve a toxic free environment. So also, again, I, I believe the next speaker could help us understand a little bit more about what are the Commission's future endeavours in this regard. As for the European Parliament, we aspire for a legal framework that protects the environment and public health to increase awareness and promote prevention measures and prudent use of pharmaceuticals, support the development of pharmaceuticals that are intrinsically less harmful for the environment and promoting green, greener manufacturing, improving the environmental risk assessment and its review, reducing wasted waste and improving the management of waste, expanding environmental monitoring, and also filling under knowledge gaps with strong scientific evidence. And this is also one of the main uh, topics here at the European Parliament. We understand there needs to be, and we need to have more research on this topic. So with this, I finalize my intervention and I, I thank you once again very much for hearing me out and most importantly for the honor of the invitation to address you. Thank you very much uh, Sarah and um, uh, I will uh, give the, the floor to the second uh, speaker of uh, this first panel and there is uh, Hans Stilstra uh, from Belgium and he works on the uh, commission's uh, directorate general environment and uh, is currently the deputy head of the unit uh, sustainable freshwater management at the DG environment. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, giving me the floor, uh, Mr. Giard, and uh, thank you also to the previous speaker um, who indeed uh, covered uh, some of the ground that I was also going to cover, but I think I have my own perspective on this. Um, yeah, as you said, I, I work for the European Commission for the, uh, the part that is responsible for environment. This is a file we do very much together with the colleagues uh, responsible for health policy. And I think that's an absolutely crucial uh, point to emphasize that this is not an environmental agenda only. It cannot be an environmental agenda only. It has to be a, a common agenda both from the health and from the, um, from the environmental perspective. Um, and, and, and therefore one of the challenges is also to bring together um, these two communities, which, which are not used, I think, to deal with one another so very often. Um, so I think it's fair to say that the starting point for a lot that we do at the moment is the European Green Deal that we adopted in, in 2019. And this contained this ambition for um, uh, this zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. Um, from the recognition that, all, that we need to protect human health from dangerous chemicals, of course, as we have said for a long time, um, but also to protect the ecosystems. And, and that is not simply a lofty uh, objective. It's also crucial, I would say, given the overwhelming evidence that there is a risk, uh, there is impact from pharmaceutical residues on, um, on ecosystems. Uh, indeed, I think the, the jury is still out on what is the impact on human health, but I think as far as ecosystems is concerned, it's pretty obvious. Um, and uh, the MEP has just mentioned some examples of that in relation to fish. Uh, the same can be said about uh, impact on, on dung beetles uh, that have an impact subsequently on soil quality. Um, uh, 
and, and, and apart from this effect on ecosystems, there's also the issue that um, the more pharmaceutical residues we find in water, the more we need to put um, our wastewater treatment facilities at work, uh, who, which are not in all cases, but often able to remove pharmaceuticals from wastewater, but it comes at the cost, of course. And this is at a time when we are uh, trying to be mindful of the cost that people pay for their water. Um, and of course, this is also coming at a time that we are mindful, very mindful of energy consumption of these uh, wastewater treatment plants. And, and the more we let them clean, the more energy they will use and the further we are away from our objectives of mitigating um, uh, climate change. So I think that's it's also important uh, from that perspective. Now, one thing to formulate uh, objectives um, it's another one uh, to turn them into concrete action and to follow up on those at the end of the day um, and for this the european green deal announced three uh, particular strands of action um, or at least three I, the mep mentioned a few more that they are indeed also relevant but I would mention three in, in particular, the chemical strategy for sustainability with its aim to revise the legislation that we currently have on chemicals to streamline the monitoring, the assessment, uh, a degree of reallocation of tasks to make sure that we assess risks in a, um, in a harmonized and efficient way. Then the Zero Pollution Action Plan um, for air, water and soil, which we adopt in 2021, I believe. Time flies, um, but I think it was in 21 that we adopted it. And that contains a range of, of actions that I will come back to in a moment. And then, of course, there is farm to fork, not to forget uh, the ambition uh, expressed that the for, for this um, agricultural strategy to reduce um, the sales of antimicrobials and their use um, uh, for farmed animals and, and in aquaculture, which is another significant source of those uh, of those uh, products. Um, specifically on pharmaceuticals, indeed, there is, and it predates the European Green Deal by a little bit, there is this uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment strategy, um, which I will not go through in, in detail, but it's it's a, a large range of actions um, that cover the entire life cycle of the um, uh, of pharmaceuticals and the pharmaceutical strategy um, that came, I think, in 2020, um, which I will also go into in a, in a little bit more detail at the end of the day. Um, the strategies are in place. We have started to turn them into concrete policy proposals. And as uh, Ms. Sardas just said, uh, the pharmaceuticals in the environment strategy was in principle positively received by, by the council, by the parliament, but there was also criticism. It's fair to acknowledge that. And the criticism was interesting in the sense that um, it was said that the strategy essentially had too little teeth, legislative teeth. So, um, and, and our reaction at the time was, look, yes, the ingredients are there, but it will take some time to turn that into legislation. And I think we are now at that stage that we are uh, translating uh, a lot of the actions into actual legislation. So to be um, specific now, um, we are planning a number of revisions uh, over, well, basically this year we are coming with the proposals in most cases. First of all, very important, I think, um, urban wastewater. We have legislation already since about 30 years, a little over 30 years on uh, regulating the, the collection and treatment of urban wastewater. This legislation is going to be revised with the effect that more wastewater will be connected and um, wastewater will be treated um, 
more um, fundamentally, shall we say, in areas of risks, so the bigger agglomerations and, and where water is currently, water quality is currently at risk. Then we plan to uh, come with the proposal to revise the um, industrial emissions directive. And one interesting proposal there I find is that we will, uh, that the intention at least at this stage is to cover also the sector of intensive uh, rearing and dairy farms. Um, the revision then of the list of priority substances in water, in surface water and in groundwater. Um, the plan is, and, and that will come out in September if all goes well, the plan is to uh, also include some pharmaceuticals now in um, those lists of substances. And once a substance is, is listed, it obliges a member state to um, make sure that the level, uh, the concentration of those substances is below a certain uh, level. So once, say, diclofenac uh, or uh, ibuprofen or another uh, one of the uh, antimicrobials is, uh, is listed, it means that member states need to make sure that the levels of those substances go down. Um, <clears throat> The veterinary pharmaceuticals legislation was already revised uh, some time ago, and uh, the plan is to do the same now for the human pharmaceuticals. Um, it's interesting maybe to note in this context that there was uh, a public um, consultation not so long ago, uh, which showed that uh, the respondents felt that the earlier revision of this legislation in 2004 was not sufficiently effective to reduce the environmental footprint of, uh, of pharmaceuticals. Now, the next revision planned for this year again um, is, meant, is meant to strengthen uh, environmental risk assessment um, and conditions of use and revise the um, manufacturing and supply provisions in the, in the legislation to improve the transparency and to reinforce the oversight of the, um, of the supply chain, which um, I think is, is also important because we would like, of course, our pharmaceutical industry and whoever is responsible for putting pharmaceuticals on the market to have a very um, to, to act in full knowledge of, uh, of their uh, of what happens in, in their supply chain. So that also when we buy pharmaceuticals here in Europe, we are sure that not only they are safe, uh, but also that we are at least aware of, of what are the uh, uh, environmental implications uh, further up the, the supply chain. So I think 2021 uh, from the commission side will really be the year where we propose a number of pieces of legislation that should have an important effect on uh, the presence of pharmaceuticals in the environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, so uh, it's uh, at the end of our first panel, and it's interesting to to, to point out that uh, it's uh, this pollution is a more common agenda, and uh, that it's uh, it's moving. Right now, so uh, let's uh, let's go now to the the second uh, second panel uh, with a view of uh, the skate order, and uh, with the first, uh, I will first give the floor to Sébastien Sauvé uh, from Canada, and uh, is talking from Montreal, where he's a professor in uh, environmental chemistry, uh, an expert on the impacts of uh, emerging contaminants such as pesticides, endocrine disruption on health and the environment. Thank you, Sebastian, for being uh, with us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the time. Uh, thank you for the earlier speaker who's, who's put the plate uh, very interestingly. Uh, I'll give you a, a a quick perspective from uh, my point of view, which comes from the chemistry, agriculture, ecotax, ecotoxicology side of things. Uh, new mass spectrometry instruments are very sensitive. And uh, we need to understand that 
given a little bit of time and effort, it's fairly easy for a good chemist to see traces of pharmaceuticals nearly everywhere if we put the effort into it. So it's, it's important that the uh, legislations or the regulations integrate some of the potential health impacts, some of the potential ecotox. We have to make the link between uh, observing concentration and what those concentration really do have in, in terms of impact. Uh, also, those instruments can uh, monitor hundreds of compounds. So it's fairly easy within, at least within a tight group of similar compounds, uh, it is uh, fairly easy to monitor a lot of them at the same time. So the, the, the question has been raised as to how many compounds should we monitor and is it feasible? Well, today's instruments are much uh, have a very high performance, so they can be done. But if there's one message I really want to get across is a lot of the field data uh, where we go out and look in agricultural field, whether in the soil, in the water, the drainage water, agricultural drainage or rivers or wastewaters, uh, we see that oftentimes uh, metabolites or byproducts are much higher than the original compound. So it is very important in terms of monitoring and the regulations pertaining, pertaining that too, uh, we need to integrate potential, well, whether it's a metabolite from the consumption going through the animal or, or, or the person, or whether it is uh, byproducts coming from photooxidation or ozonation. If we have a peculiar treatment with ozonation, we will generate byproducts. And that co the concentration of those byproducts uh, has been observed to be uh, uh, at least one order of magnitude higher in some cases, so that if we focus the monitoring, the regulation on target compounds that are being prescribed or given to, to uh, animals, uh, we might just not see the, the real problem, which is byproducts. Um, and then the other component of this is if we go on regulating to target specific compounds, well, the regulation should include the byproducts of that compound because it's too, if we want to reduce the impact and look at a compound that disappears quickly, but it's a, a compound that actually generates persistent byproducts that are toxic or that have potential impact, then it's really uh, important to integrate the metabolite as a group when we regulate things, because otherwise it is a bit tricky, uh, definitely. And I see that I'm being asked, when should we monitor these things? One of the point where we've seen antibiotics from agricultural field, especially like pig or uh, production with high, uh, intensive in terms of antibiotics, we can see some uh, very high levels of byproducts and uh, any water treatment that uses old ozone would also generate. Ozone is very good at generating byproducts. If the ozonation process is, is, is complete, then you generate byproducts and then ozone destroys the byproduct. But if the ozonation is partial, you are, uh, well, you're looking for trouble and you're generating byproducts. Uh, and then in terms of some of the pharmaceutical health component, we probably should have a look at Cases where there are alternatives, uh, when we can use different analgesic, we can use different, uh, different pharmaceuticals that have a similar impact or a similar health benefit. Maybe we should look at the green side of things and try and pick the, the greener version in as much as there's no uh, differences in terms of health impacts. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stay at this because there's a lot of people that need to, to express themselves. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, thank you very much for uh, for your point of view, and uh, it's uh, interesting to, to to see the importance of um, uh, byproducts. And um, now uh, we'll uh, now listen uh, a French uh, colleague from uh, Limoges, Christophe Dago, uh, who is professor at the University of uh, uh, Limoges, and uh, appointed uh, to the National School of uh, Engineering also. 
uh, and is specialist in antibiotic resistance, uh, micro pollutants uh, in the environment, and is currently uh, deputy director and head of the water and environment department. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you, Jean-Christophe, for your kind introduction. And I will try to explain the problem of uh, antibiotic in environment in a few minutes. So, so uh, as you certainly know, antibiotic resistance is um, now a major public health problem causing 1.3 million deaths per year worldwide. So the exponential appearance of antibiotic resistance is explained by um, several facts. Uh, the first one is that uh, resistance is co-substantial with antibiotics, with the occurrence of antibiotics in environment. The increase in antimicrobial resistance seems to be linked with antibiotics use in human and veterinary medicine. The lack of sanitary system in some countries, the use of antibiotics in agricultural livestock, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we know that uh, antibiotic prescriptions are increasing. We know also that antibiotic pollution is increasing. So resistance is increasing. And because resistance is increasing, the efficiency of care is decreasing. So it seems uh, logical. But understanding the, this phenomena is not so simple. And uh, because like all chemical products used by human, their final destination is the environment. So my topic is to, um, to see what happened with antibiotics in environment. And what is really the role of the environment in this postulate? Is the environment a genetic trash can, a genetic library allowing bacteria to resist everything? A genetic reactor which promotes gene transfer? A genetic culture growth? We will see some. And uh, I will try to summarize my speak in uh, five points. So the, the first one is the origin of antibiotics in the environment. So we, we have to know that antibiotics have been present in the environment for millions of years. And currently, exogenous antibiotics reach the environment via human extraction, which pass, which pass in the best of cases, that mean in uh, rich countries, through uh, urban wastewater treatment plant, and in uh, developing countries through uh, improper disposal. But also, we could find uh, anti- uh, antibiotics by the use in animal production, in the treatment of free trees, in fish farming, in discharge from antibiotic production plants, especially in countries like China or India, where 80% or 90% of Western antibiotics production take place. And without forgetting through the development of transport and tourism. So the environment is a receptacle, the, receptac the mirror of uh, human activity in which the ecosystem balance is broken. We are now in an accelerating dynamic of dissemination. So this, the second point is the environmental concentration. So it's definitive low to very low. For example, in a river, is it close to 10, 100 nanogram per liter and exceeding one microgram, 10 microgram per liter in anthropogenic influence. But, but concentration of 6,000 6, micrograms per liter of ciprofloxacin were detected in India with effluence about 31 milligrams per liter in. But generally, the concentration found are lower than the typical minimal inhibitory concentration, the MIC, which is between 10 and 10,000 micrograms per liter. But we have to remember that selection may occur at concentration below the mic. So this environmental concentration of antibiotic at most often lower than concentration predicted or shown to select for resistance strain in the lab. So one of the problems is the impact of antibiotic in the environment. So the first impact is the toxicity and the intrinsic toxicity of antibiotics is not easy to demonstrate in environment. It's however shown that antibiotic in environment would have impact on biodiversity at concentration, however, higher than that found in the environment for a single molecule. Our study have also calculated the RQ, the risk coefficient, which is the ratio between the MEC and the PNEC. MEC is the maximum concentration of detected antibiotics in environment. 
and the PNEC, the predicted no effect concentration value. For example, for the ciprofloxacin we spoke about, the LQ is equal to 286, which is a very very high tolerance for uh, concentration. Okay, and uh, uh, this is a very very high tolerance for characterizing a risk for human health. Another example is uh, for fluor fluor fluoroquinolone. Because fluoroquinolone is a molecule we found everywhere in the environment. But as you know, the problem with antibiotic is not only the toxicity, it's also the selection of resistant bacteria. So, uh, Joachim Larson, your view suggests that external environments already harbor resistance factors for all antibiotics that will ever be developed. The selection pressure promotes the mobilization and horizontal transfer of a large range of antibiotic resistant genes to many bacterial species, potentially to those causing disease. We have talked uh, on the environmental genetic library, and as you know, the environmental microbiome has immense diversity with a large diversity of genes ready to be exchanged into pathogenic bacteria. And why? Why in the environment? We have different hypotheses to explain the dissemination of resistant bacteria in the environment. One is a direct rejection of bacteria and resistant bacteria that have acquired resistance in your stomach undergoing antibiotic therapy. The question is, will this bacterium have the opportunity to share its resistant genes with an environmental bacterium before it disappears? We know also that metals and antibacterial biocide can, in many cases, co-select for antibiotic resistance strain via cross-resistance or co-resistance mechanisms. This means that there will be a strong correlation between anthropic activity, pollution, and the emergence of resistance. But it's not so simple, and we need to be sure to design a kind of systematic demonstration of the phenomena of co-selection in the environment. But my perception, our perception, is that resistance to metal and biocid certainly have a relationship with resistance to antibiotics. So the role of environment remains complex to understand, but we are sure that it represents the place to be to have a prospective vision of the dissemination. And now the fifth point, what should be done to slow the evolution of antimicrobial resistance? So we can find a lot of proposal, adaptation of the prescriptions, reducing consumption, as with veterinarian success of the Equantibio plan in France, the monitoring with standardized indicators, Integron, E. coli, ESBL, etc. The assessment of environmental resilience, a real collaboration with developing countries to monitor the consumption, production and discharge of polluted effluent, proposed facilities, etc., etc. But also the impact of climate change and the occurrence of contamination. And on the other hand, the proposal of new molecules environmentally friendly. So one of the exciting approach is the One Health approach. We should make it possible to associate all the stakeholders in all socioeconomic contexts. So to conclude with a, a, a non-definitive conclusion, antibiotic resistance is a global fight. We haven't lost it yet, and we cannot lose it. And the environment is one of the actors. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Christophe. And, uh, uh, obviously, we are in, in the One Health concept with uh, air more uh, selection and uh, the, the risk, the Damocles uh, uh, in overhead with the uh, development of air more. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we'll uh, listen to uh, the next speaker with uh, Patrick Costemont, uh, who is a full professor at the University of Namur in Belgium, and is president of the Research Institute of Life, Earth and Environment, and director of the research unit in, research unit, sorry, in environmental and evolutionary biology, where he studies the mechanisms of uh, acclimatation and adaptation of uh, aquatic organisms to a changing environment. 
Thank you, Patrick. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Gia, Gia, for this introduction, and thank you also to FIAM for the invitation to this uh, very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, okay, so as, as you mentioned, as you know, so uh, I'm uh, more specialized on uh, ecotoxicology, and so I will uh, make my presentation with regard to all these uh, environmental issues and from an ecotoxicological perspective. Uh, and my presentation will uh, include eight points. Some are very short, some is, are a li little bit longer. So first of all, uh, when we are talking about uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment, uh, what are we talking about? There are several hundreds of pharmaceutical residues that can be detected in the aquatic environment, uh, mainly when we are talking about uh, Europe and uh, European surface waters, uh, but rarely in, uh, in groundwater. We have uh, done uh, a survey uh, in collaboration with the, the, the Walloon uh, company of water supply and uh, the presence of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals in groundwater uh, are very low. Um, now, with regard to the surface waters, uh, the concentration can vary greatly between molecules, uh, river types, uh, and countries, of course. So ranging from less than one nanogram per liter for some chemicals, for some pharmaceuticals, to several milligram per liter for some others. And by crossing the abundance and occurrence of the molecules uh, detected for, for more than 1,500 sampling points in, in Wallonia, in Belgium, uh, we have seen that uh, the analgesics are by far the most present, but their persistence is rather low because of course they are rapidly degraded. But as it was mentioned by Professor Sauvé uh, before, uh, the metabolites of, uh, for example, the paracetamol are uh, rarely analyzed in the survey and should be analyzed, in fact. Um, on the other hand, uh, cardiovascular uh, drugs and neuroleptics are much more persistent. And they are also quite well represented in Belgium uh, surface waters, ranging between 20% for the, the cardiovascular drugs to 6% respect, respectively, when we are uh, considering all these pharmaceuticals. Uh, okay, so um, now we, we have different uh, tools to evaluate the toxicity of these uh, pharmaceuticals. If we are considering the acute toxicity test, for example, based on some small cladocerin, maybe you know the, the Daphnia, Daphnia mania or Daphnia pulex as a bioassay, um, the, the test indicates that the EC50 48 hours. So impacting 50% of the population of this Daphnia, uh, the EC50 is generally very high in the order of tens to hundreds of milligrams per liter. So uh, very far from the environmental concentrations. For some neuroleptics, such as the diazepam, the values are in the order of uh, milligram per liter. But it is usually much higher than what we can find uh, in the environment. However, if we are looking for the chronic toxicity studies, uh, these studies have reported a physiological alteration in aquatic organisms at much lower concentration. So for example, around 10 nanogram per liter for neuroleptics and between 100 and 1000 nanogram per liter for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. With a lot of effects, such as uh, the altered survival and growth, uh, impacts on reproduction, immune responses, resistance to pathogens, uh, DNA damages, etc. So that suggests that there is a real environmental risk since organisms, and I mean here the aquatic organisms, 
can be subjected to such low concentrations of pharmaceutical residues throughout their lives and not during few days as in the acute toxicity test. And in this respect, uh, the release of synthetic estrogens is considered a problem because of the endocrine disrupting effects at very low doses at the range also of the nanogram per liter for ethinyl estradiol. Okay, so this is um, another aspect. Now I would like to focus on some ecotoxicological issues, uh, mainly concerning the bioconcentration, the bioaccumulation and the biomagnification of the pharmaceuticals along the food chain. The bioconcentration, which is the ratio between the concentration of a chemical in the body of an organism uh, and the concentration of the same chemical in the environment, this bioconcentration uh, may vary according to the type of molecule. Um, but um, most uh, non steroidal uh, anti inflammatory drugs uh, can bioconcentrate in aquatic organisms. And so greatly increasing the concentration of these molecules in specific organs. For example, we can uh, find in the, the liver of, uh, of fish several thousand times more than in the surrounding water. So uh, the bioconcentration can be uh, a concern. Uh, in contrast, uh, the biomagnification which is uh, representing uh, the increase of the concentration along the food chain. So for example, from phytoplankton to fish in an aquatic environment appears to be reservoir. So suggesting that the, the molecules are rapidly excreted uh, by the aquatic organisms. But if you are looking to the literature, there are relatively few studies that have uh, investigated the biomagnification uh, aspects of these uh, pharmaceuticals. So much more studies are needed uh, to get a more valid, valid uh, conclusion. So an, another important issue in ecotoxicology, and I don't think that the, 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 pre, the previous speakers have talked about that, is the, the cocktail effect due to the presence of a mixture of pharmaceuticals in the environment, uh, especially, of course, in wastewater treatment plant effluents. So some ph pharmaceutical residues can have additive, sy synergistic, or antagonistic effects uh, when they are present simul simultaneously in the environment. So we have tools, models, to predict these mixture effects, uh, depending on the type of um, action of these uh, pharmaceuticals or molecules in general. So we use predictive models uh, to combine these effects of xenobiotics when they are released into the environment. And these models di differ depending on the mode of action of the chemical mixture. The concentration addition model, for example, fits quite well with the addition of molecules with a similar mode of action. For example, if you are combining different type of anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen, diclofenac, naproxen, etc. Uh, while the independent action models fit much better with molecules with different mode of, of action. In fact, we realize that this is the theory, but in practice, uh, this doesn't work very well with pharmaceutical residues. And sometimes these models do doesn't fit well uh, for uh, molecules that have the same mode of action or having different mode of actions. Okay, so another aspect is the, the problem of the sewage treatment plants, as they are the major sources of pharmaceutical residues in surface waters. Of course, because they collect and they treat most of the domestic, hospital, and industrial effluents. Uh, 
um, the problem is that the sewage treatment plants have not been constructed to remove micropollutants compounds. So increasing the efficiency of sewage treatment plant by adding components such as the UV treatment or other treatments is not really realistic because it will increase significantly the cost of the water treatment. This aspect has been highlighted uh, also before by other speakers. Uh, we have in, in my laboratory in collaboration with other uh, French and Belgium uh, universities and research, research center, we have conducted a four year European Interreg project in order to evaluate the impacts of pharmaceutical residues in mixture when they are released through the effluents from sewage treatment plants. And we have evaluated the impacts on a large set of aquatic organisms, including mosses, uh, mollusks, crustaceans, and fish. And we used a, a caging approach. So in other words, the organisms were placed into floating cages upstream and downstream of the effluents released in the river Meuse. It's the main river in Belgium, but also we test it also in the French part of the river Meuse. And what we observed is that for most of them, uh, for most of the organisms, the, the impacts uh, were rather moderate, but significant and alterations have been detected for several biological functions of the contaminated organisms exposed downstream of the effluents when we are comparing with upstream, uh, affecting, for example, the reproductive and the immune systems, as well as the energetic metabolism after only three weeks of exposure in cages. Again, the organisms are exposed to these chemicals during their whole life. So we can expect that at the long term, the, the alteration can be much more dramatic. Um, to, to finish, I would like to say that the, the least contaminating compound is of course the one we don't use. Uh, even if we can reduce the consumption of pharmaceuticals and improve their management, it does not seem possible, of course, to stop using them. Uh, and so I think that the pharmaceutical industry can play a major role in reducing its environmental impact by designing pharmaceuticals that are inherently more environmental friendly. Uh, we are currently working, for example, with a Belgian company, a Belgian pharmaceutical company, uh, Mitra Pharmaceuticals, to assess the environmental impact of estetrol, the E4, which is quite important because this is an estrogen that is produced by the fetal liver and is used as an alternative to the use of the synthetic ethanyl estradiol in the formulation of contra contraceptive uh, means. Um, is it, ethanyl estradiol is well known to be a potent endocrine disruptor. Uh, using zebrafish at different developmental stages as a biological model, uh, our results indicate that this estetrol, for example, seems to induce much less endocrine disrupting effects on aquatic organisms than ethanyl solidiol, a really, really less effect. And so may therefore be an excellent alternative to this synthetic estrogen with regard to the environment. So I, I will just conclude by mentioning that probably one important issue is to change the, the mode of production and to find alternatives that are much less uh, impacting uh, the, the environment. Okay, this is what uh, I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for, for the opportunity to, to present this. Uh, so, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And uh, it's, a, it's very, uh, actually, ecotoxicology uh, so research, but ecotoxicology are very uh, important on uh, your, your talk. Uh, 
uh, point out that uh, some uh, some tools are still available and uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. So we'll now uh, move to the veterinary uh, field of uh, our, uh, our uh, panel uh, with a presentation uh, by uh, Despona Yatridou uh, from Greece, who is a senior policy officer uh, for the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe. And uh, she's also appointed as general secretary of uh, veterinary continuous education in Europe and does research in uh, veterinary education competencies uh, on also antimicrobial resistance and one else on uh, public policy. Thank you, Despana. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, the introduction and the nice uh, uh, the invitation to this discussion. I'm joining to today on behalf of FE, where I'm a senior policy officer uh, I'm working in the FE office in Brussels since uh, 2010, and uh, one of my dossiers is indeed One Health. So I will start with a little presentation of uh, our federation. Um, the FE, the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, represents the veterinary profession, that is to say about 300,000 veterinarians in Europe. It is an umbrella organization of national veterinary associations and chambers in 38 European countries. The veterinary profession is a very diverse profession with many different career paths. That is why FE embraces four sections, each one of which represents a vital part of the profession. One section represents the practitioners. This is the part of the profession that takes care directly of the health and welfare of all kinds of animal species. This is the best known role of veterinarians for the society. Another section of FE represents the veterinary hygienists. These are veterinarians involved in ensuring the safety of food on our table. They have a key role in protecting public health. A third section of FE represents the veterinary state officers. These are veterinarians who work for competent authorities in many different roles, which are key in protecting public health as well as animal health and welfare. Finally, the fourth section of FE represents the veterinarians working in education, research and industry. These are veterinarians often going beyond the veterinary sector who contribute through many different roles in promoting knowledge and innovation in health of both animals and humans. FE represents the whole profession and strives to, play, to speak through one voice on behalf of all these professionals. The mission of FE, as stated in our current strategy, is to enhance animal health, animal welfare, public health, and protect the environment. Though we fully embrace the One Health concept. It is not that FE just embraces the One Health concept, it is that veterinarians have received One Health education. Veterinary students are educated in a way that prepares them for all the different roles I've just mentioned. They are taught and understand the mechanism of spread of disease and other kinds of risks within individuals of the same species, across different species, across animals and humans, and the surrounding environment. We are taught how to protect the health of animals and humans and of the environment they serve. Veterinary curricula, are One Health curricula that develop in One Health mentality for all veterinarians. Coming to the topic of our today's discussion, I would like to share with you some uh, insights on how the veterinary sector currently contributes to the protection of the environment, starting from the time that the veterinary pharmaceutical product arrives on the shelf and it's available for use in animals. We all know that the development of a pharmaceutical product takes several years and includes a big amount of preclinical and clinical research. What is perhaps less known is that since 1992, all products that apply for authorization as veterinary medicines for use in animals in the European Union must pass a mandatory environmental risk assessment as part of their authorization process. Veterinary products 
can only enter the EU market if they do not pose a serious risk to the environment. If a potential risk is identified as part of this assessment, the product must undergo a deeper investigation to find out if the risk indeed exists, and in the case that the risk exists, if it can be mitigated through the implementation of certain uh, measures and warnings. If the last is the case, uh, the outcome of the environmental risk assessment, precautions must apply for their use. Products with an acceptable risk are refused authorization and never end up on the EU market. Mitigation measures, um, they are measures to be implemented uh, aiming to eliminate, reduce or control or offset the risk. They are part of the leaflet information for veterinary medicines and they are part of the prescription. Veterinarians are educated to consider the environmental impact. Prescription comes always with an advice on proper administration, on proper discharge of the veterinary medicines and their containers, on special precautions with regard to handling of animals, of their excretions or of their products and byproducts. Further to this, it needs to be acknowledged that strict rules apply for the establishments of farms in a region. These rules are also include the mandatory environmental assessment and planning of the handling of manure, effluents, waste, and byproducts. Respective European and national legislation exists that aims to minimize and prevent from uh, any impact or mi minimize the impact on the surrounding environment and surface water in particular. The same applies for clinics and veterinary hospitals. FE has been always promoting measures for the protection of the environment as part of the responsible use practices. Together with EPIRUMA, the European Platform for Responsible Use of Medicines in Animals, we have addressed proper waste management as part of the responsible use of medicines in animals. EPIRUMA is a multi-stakeholder platform engaging representatives of farmers, veterinarians, the animal health industry, the feed industry, and national responsible use initiatives to promoting the implementation of best practices in the field. The EPIRUMA guideline on management of pharmaceutical waste put forward the recommendation promoting waste reduction, as well as proper disposal of veterinary medicines. Whereas pharmaceutical waste may be inter immediate packaging or, or uh, leftovers after treatments, expired products or products not stored properly, exceeding quantities, for example, of non-prescription medicines um, that are bought, bought over the counter, uncompleted courses of treatment, excretions of animals or effluents from farms, most of them can be easily monitored and mitigated via proper interventions. To summarize, the risk of pharmaceuticals in the environment is not a new topic in veterinary practice and has been addressed. However, pharmaceuticals and their metabolites found on the environment may derive from many different human activities. Therefore, today's discussion is very important within the overall concept of One Health, and I look forward to it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Desmona. Uh, uh, federation like yours uh, is a, a very, very important tool uh, to, to protect the environment. Thank you very much. Uh, now, the next speaker uh, is uh, from Sweden, and it's uh, Sofia. Grinstal, she's a president of the Swedish Medical Association, a specialist for antimicrobial resistance, and she is also a chair of the Education and Research Delegation. Thank you, Sofia. Thank you. And thank you for inviting the CPME to today's panel discussion and for your interest in the European doctors' views on how to how we can ensure access to high quality, safe and environmental sustainable medicines. We certainly need to strike the right balance between environmental protection and access to medicines. 
And this can be achieved by, firstly, raising awareness and promoting prudent use of pharmaceuticals and informing patients about safe disposal methods for unused or expired medicines. And secondly, supporting greener manufacturing and reducing wastage and improving waste management in the pharmaceutical sector. While the latter is crucial, and we recognize the importance of increasing environmental requirements for all sectors, for all actors in the pharmaceutical sector, as a medical doctor, I will focus my short introductory remarks on how healthcare professionals and patients should contribute to reducing the negative impact of pharmaceuticals on the environment. I would therefore like to give three examples of key actions that can improve the appropriate medicine use and disposal with an emphasis on antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance, which play a central role in discussed topics when we recognize the interrelationship between human and veterinary, veterinary medicine and the environment. First of all, medicine should be dispensed in a personalized manner for each patient. Overconsumption and inappropriate use of medicine is detrimental to patients' health, but also a negative, has negative environmental aspects or impact. For example, over-the-counter medicines represent a considerable share of the total amount of medicines used and are likely to be overused. Therefore, patients should be educated to buy medicines only as needed and to avoid stockpiling medicines that cannot be used before expiry. A prescription requirement certainly contributes to controlling the use of medicines which potential, with potential uh, particular serious effects, such as antibiotics, antidepressants and hormones. However, we are also aware of overprescribing problems that has been reported in some countries, for example, when it comes to antidepressants. This is why appropriate healthcare professionals' education is indispensable, and I'll touch upon this in a moment. And in regard to antibiotics, it is of utmost importance that antibiotics are available only on prescription, as selling antimicrobials over the counter and self medication by patients is likely to result in inappropriate in antibiotic use and fostering the emergence of resistant bacteria. In addition, antibiotics sh should also be dispensed in pack sizes according to the duration of the treatment to reduce waste. Second, doctors and pharmacists should inform patients what to do with unused or expired medicines. Doctors and pharmacists should encourage returning expired and unused medicines for appropriate disposal. For example, patients should bring back medicines to the pharmacy where they can be probably disposed. Without providing patients with such information, we risk that medicines will be used inappropriately, reused by persons to whom they were not originally prescribed. They may also be disposed inapparently and leave the residues in the environment. What in case of antimicrobials can lead to emergence of resistant bacteria in the environment. And third and last, healthcare professionals and patients should be educated on the appropriate use of medicines. Education and raising awareness are key. Healthcare professionals must be kept up to date reg regarding the latest developments in research and good practices in minimizing the negative impact of medicines on the environment. They should be provided with clear evidence-based prescribing guidelines on prudent use of pharmaceuticals posing a risk to or via the environment. These guidelines should provide advice across clinical indications. At EU level, we should facilitate the exchange of best practices among healthcare professionals on the environmentally safe disposal of medical, medicinal products and clinical waste and the collection of pharmaceuticals residues. In the context of AMR, cross-sectional education and collaboration between doctors, veterinarians, dentists, pharmacists and other healthcare professionals 
following the One Health approach is particularly important. Lastly, it is equally vital that patients are educated and supported in responsible self-care behaviors. For example, li limiting medicine seeking and prudent medicine use and disposal. To sum up, healthcare professionals and patients can make a significant contribution to reducing the environmental impact of medicines through their appropriate use and disposal. To achieve this goal, however, education and awareness raising campaigns are indispensable. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, it's important to have a, a good education, actually, <laughs> for professional and for everybody. Uh, now uh, we'll uh, listen to uh, Jean-Yves Stenwick uh, from uh, Belgium, uh, and he's a member of the Health Care Without Arm Europe, and uh, he uh, leads um, Europe Safer Pharma uh, program, which aims to reduce the pharmaceutical pollution and limit its contribution to the development of uh, antimicrobial resistance. Thank you, Jean-Yves. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gia, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, as you've been saying, I'm working for the organization Healthcare with Alham Europe. We are a network of thousands of hospital healthcare leaders and healthcare professionals. Uh, we have members across Europe and partners across the globe. And the goal of the organization is really to create a sustainable uh, healthcare sector, uh, which also means um, more sustainable uh, pharmaceuticals. So we know that pharmaceutical pollution is a, um, a global problem. More than 770 pharmaceutical agents or the metabolites have been detected uh, all across the world uh, on all continents uh, in 75 countries. And as mentioned previously, this is an issue because uh, pharmaceuticals in the environment can act as a driver for the development and spread of antimicrobial resistance which uh, is identified by the WHO as one of the biggest health threats facing humanity today. They can also have harmful effects on animal and plant life and on ecosystems more generally, and also some questions on the potential effects on human health, since uh, small concentrations of pharmaceutical residues have been found in drinking water. And it's interesting to note that uh, pharmaceuticals can actually enter the environment across the life cycle. There are three main pathways um, into the environment, the first one is uh, during uh, manufacturing. A previous speaker has mentioned the high concentration of uh, ciprofloxacin that was found in uh, manufacturing effluents in India. The second stage, um, the second pathway is in case, uh, well, when uh, the drugs are being excreted by patients. Uh, it is estimated that depending on the drug, between 30 to 90% of uh, all orally administ administered pharmaceuticals can be excreted in uh, the faces and urines of patients. Uh, and we know that, uh, as mentioned as well before, uh, wastewater treatment plants have varying capacity uh, in uh, being able to remove uh, these pharmaceutical residues. And the last uh, uh, entry path um, for pharmaceuticals uh, in the environment is in case of inappropriate disposal practices, when, for example, they have flushed down the toilets. Um, there has been a recent um, study by a research project led by the, the University of York in the UK that monitored uh, over a thousand uh, sampling sites uh, for pharmaceutical uh, residues uh, in more than 100 countries all across the world. And this research project showed that the highest concentrations were actually in areas associated with poor wastewater and waste management infrastructure and pharmaceutical manufacturing. And, and this is maybe the, the key message to, to take from my talk here. Um, according to this research project, concentrations of at least one active pharmaceutical ingredient were above levels considered safe for aquatic organisms or of concerns in terms of selection for antimicrobial resistance in a quarter of all monitor sites. So this is really alarming. And we often say that pharmaceuticals in the environment are an emerging environmental issue, but it's not emerging anymore. It is there. Already in 2017, uh, the UN Environment Programme, UNEP, had already identified uh, growing antimicrobial resistance linked to the discharge of drugs into the environment as one of the most worrying health threats uh, we face today. So this was already five years ago. 
And in the European Union, we have a key opportunity now uh, to change and to strengthen the regulatory framework in relation to pharmaceutical residues uh, and the contribution to the development and spread of antimicrobial resistance uh, in the framework of the ongoing revision of the EU general uh, pharmaceutical legislation. So that's why in my talk today, I would like to highlight recommendation in three main areas. So the first area is about um, improving transparency and sustainability uh, of the pharmaceutical supply chains. So I've mentioned before, we know that drug manufacturing is a significant source of pharmaceutical pollution. Yet there are currently no specific rules in the European Union um, regarding uh, manufacturing pollution uh, of active pharmaceutical ingredients because active pharmaceutical ingredients are not covered by the REACH regulation. So there is a need for a better framework here. We know as well that uh, a lot of pharmaceuticals are also uh, produced not in the EU, but in third countries, especially in the case of antibiotics. I think a former previous speaker has said that uh, India and China uh, were clearly leading the way in terms of uh, antibiotic uh, production. So we, so we see there is also a need uh, for a global approach to this issue. Uh, there are ongoing um, voluntary industry-led initiatives that are welcome. To, uh, in with regard to uh, making um, the manufacturing framework more sustainable, but they are not enough. Uh, if we look at the AMR Industry Alliance, for example, well, they have developed antibiotic discharge targets, but these targets only focus on surface water uh, as opposed to targeting manufacturing wastewater. Uh, we know as well that uh, within this initiative, pollution levels are not directly measured in water samples, but estimated from internal data. And finally, the lack of access to key data hampers oversight of the whole process. And this is a trend we see uh, across the pharmaceutical industry because there is a blatant lack of transparency in the pharmaceutical supply chains, which makes the link between a company that markets a drug in Europe and the suppliers that produce the um, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, sometimes outside Europe, very difficult to, to, to establish. Um, for civil society organizations like, like us and regulators. So recommendations in this field is to increase transparency across the pharmaceutical supply chain. Uh, there is a good uh, practice example um, from the New Zealand, from New Zealand and, and, and the MedSafe database, for instance. We also call on, on for on, on metal criteria to be included in the good manufacturing practice framework, both at EU and WHO level. We also call on the development of environmental standards for drug production and to strengthen international collaboration and dialogue with manufacturing countries. The second aspect of my talk um, is uh, related to strengthening environmental risk assessments for human medicines, uh, which um, the, the speaker from the European Commission highlighted as a key action uh, foreseen in the pharmaceutical strategy. Um, as you may know, environmental risk assessments are the tool that is being used to evaluate and limit potential adverse effects of medicines on the environment. However, the guidelines uh, on environmental risk assessments for human medicines came into force only in 2006, uh, and also they did not apply it retroactively, which means that there are still a lot of drugs out there that we call legacy pharmaceuticals that often lack an adequate environmental risk assessment. And for many of them, there are simply no data on potential environmental impacts. If we take the example of Germany, uh, we know that in Germany, environmental data um, are only available for about 40% of the active pharmaceutical substances that have been monitored in surface water. Uh, as I've seen also some discussion in the chat, uh, ontal risk are not a criterion in the benefit risk assessments for human medicines, which means that they are not taken into account when the European Medicines Agency issues a marketing recommendation. So that uh, leads, that results in the pharmaceutical industry tending not to prioritize ontal risk assessments, uh, it also means that environmental risks are not considered in the pharmacovigilance systems, uh, which means that environmental effects are not reported after use, and referral procedures are not possible in case of environmental risk. This also means that member states tend not to develop appropriate resources for the evaluation of environmental risk assessments, and also that the, the European Medicines Agency has reduced capacity in this field. Its committees for human medicines do not include experts on on environmental risk assessment, and there is no permanent working party for environmental issues for human medicines. 
we also mention um, the problem of mixtures. And this is also a problem in relation to the limited scope that environmental risk assessment currently have. Uh, for the time being, uh, they do not consider risk of manufacturing discharge, nor risk of AMR development for production, use, and disposal, nor the risk that degradation products, metabolites, and combination effects can pose. And finally, uh, the environmental risk assessment data are often not fully public, uh, publicly available, which is in, uh, in conflict with the IRIS convention. So our recommendation is to include environmental risk in the benefit risk assessment for human medicines, to include environmental issues in the pharmacovigilance systems, to establish a catch-up procedure for pharmaceuticals, uh, for human pharmaceuticals that have been authorized on the market before 2006, and uh, to make uh, environmental risk assessment data uh, publicly accessible in an online database under the supervision of the uh, European Medicines Agency and to broaden the scope of environmental risk assessment. And finally, the third area I wanted to talk to you about today is about encouraging greener medicines, promoting responsible use and reducing pharmaceutical waste, very much in line with what the previous speaker from CPME has been uh, expressing. Uh, pharmaceuticals are designed to interact with living systems at low doses. This means that even low concentrations in the environment are a concern. And evidence of negative effects on ecosystems and non-target species has been demonstrated. We know as well that pharmaceuticals have a high carbon footprint and their production contribute to the global climate crisis. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in England, uh, the NHS um, like investigated and uh, considers that um, medicines and chemicals uh, in the supply chain represents around 20% of, of the emissions. So this is really um, uh, an important uh, part of, of emissions from the, from the health sector. Uh, yet, despite all this, um, some pharmaceuticals that have an impact on the environment are over the counter products that are commonly advertised to increase sales, which obviously is not in light in line with uh, the, the necessary prudent use. And waste from unused medicine is another problem. A directive uh, exists at EU level, but there are no implementation guidelines, which means that there are wide variation in systems across the EU. So what we recommend is to ban advertising for OTC medicines that can pose a risk to the environment, to adopt stronger market conditions for medicines with high environmental risk, to make pharmaceutical companies contribute to the financing of the post registration monitoring and, and water treatment costs that is linked to pharmaceutical pollution, which is in line with the polluter price principles, and to also compel the pharmaceutical industry to contribute to financing pharmaceutical collection schemes under the extended producer responsibility principle. Uh, so we've summarized all these points and these recommendations in a position paper that we released today. Um, putting forward 30 policy recommendations for uh, the European Commission to consider in the revision of the EU general pharmaceutical legislation. And I'll be very happy to put the link in the chat for, um, for, for your reference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Yves. Uh, uh, it's uh, interesting because uh, the last speaker uh, we'll hear today uh, is the Bernd Madsen uh, from Sweden and because he, is a chairs, uh, he chairs the uh, International Inter Association Industry Pharmaceutical uh, in the Environment Task Force, uh, who is uh, supporting this uh, forum today. And um, he's also head of the Corporate Social Responsibility on Environmental Affairs for Pfizer's operation in Sweden and co chairs the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry and Association. So maybe he will have some uh, interesting comments or answer. Uh, about uh, your, the previous talk. Thank you very much, Bengt, to, uh, to be here. Thank you, Sean Christoph. And, and yes, I could, of course, go in and, and uh, comment on several of, of jean uh, uh proposals. Uh, some of them uh, we, as an industry, actually uh, agree upon. Uh, some of them we do not believe are the most appropriate uh, measures to undertake. Uh, just for the record, I am not an employee uh, any longer for Pfizer, uh, although I have 36 years of, of experience uh, in the industry with Pfizer, but uh, nowadays working at the Swedish Trade Association and for the European uh, Federations. So uh, thanks a lot for the invitation today to share my perspectives and the industry perspective of pharmaceuticals in the environment. And as I said, I won't go into a 
at least not now, perhaps during the discussion on some of, of uh, the proposals coming from Sean Uben, Healthcare Without Harm, but giving a, a uh, more of a general uh, intervention uh, on what industry uh, is doing when it comes to pharmaceuticals and the environment. And let me start out with just saying that the industry, of course, shares a lot of the concerns that has been raised today and has been raised in several occasions uh, when we discuss pharmaceuticals in the environment. However, I think it's extremely important to, to stress that for the vast majority of pharmaceutical substances, uh, there is no environmental risk or, or threat to, to uh, human health. There are uh, some substances that needs to be addressed. I'll come back to what can be done. But before I jump into that discussion specifically, I, I'd like to take a little step backwards uh, and uh, like a broader sustainability perspective. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry addresses uh, sustainability and all the challenges we, we've heard about through the Agenda 2030 and the uh, Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Uh, our priority, of course, is uh, goal number three, good health and well-being, which is pretty much the, the reason why we do exist as an industry and why healthcare exists, to uh, providing medicinal products to enhance quality of life. And it is our absolute strongest belief that we can and we will be successful in minimizing uh, environmental impact and negative impacts on any other SDG actually, but still be, be able to, to uh, uh, secure access to, to medicines. I think that is, is very, very important to mention. Um, and if we look on some of those other SDGs, of course, number 13, fighting uh, climate change, is extremely important and there's a lot of initiatives uh, undertaken by the pharmaceutical industry to, to lower the carbon footprint of our products. Uh, and in focus for the discussion today, of course, number six on clean water and sanitation and perhaps specifically on 6.3 on water quality and pollution to, of course, improving water quality by reducing pollution. Um, and and uh, actually, jean also mentioned a little bit, bit about the different uh, pathways of substances to uh, pharmaceutical substances to the environment. Uh, roughly, we usually say that 88% comes from patient excretion, roughly 10% from, from improper, uh, improper uh, disposal of, of unused medicines and somewhere around 2% from manufacturing operations. That does not mean, however, that manufacturing discharge is unacceptable. Manufacturing uh, uh, discharges is not a problem. It can be a problem uh, if the concentrations uh, are high. And, and we need to, to, uh, to, of course, do our part there when it comes to those industry uh, discharge. I'll come back to that. But before doing that, also for these other issues on incorrect disposal and patient excretion, we, we uh, are participating in a lot of our work to, to address that and play our part uh, in, in, in that. And one of the examples, and I've seen it being raised a little bit in the chat during the discussions here, is the initiative we are doing together with a lot of the stakeholders on meds disposal. Uh, so so uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave that perhaps for the, for the discussion uh, to dig into, but, but before I end my, my intervention, let me talk a little bit about manufacturing effluents or manufacturing effluent management from the industry perspective. Uh, we have a very clear policy statement from the industry and a set of principles for what we believe is responsible effluent management. And that is both for our own operations, but also for uh, our supplier, supplier third party manufacturers. And I'll just, uh, just list them here for you. It is compliance with, of course, local laws and regulations and permits. It is compliance with 
applicable company standards that we take them uh, throughout our supply uh, network. Implementation of wastewater management programs based on good engineering principles and of course uh, our risk management work. Uh, definition of site and API, substance specific discharge targets based on having safe concentrations out in the receiving waters and also discharge of manufacturing wastewater containing API always must have an environmental risk assessment with it. And, and those like key principles, set of principles are supported by, by a technical guidance document, which is like a good practice that we as an industry uh, share across our uh, supply network to help us work with, with this. But also, uh, as already been mentioned by, by a lot of relevant documents from networks, uh, initi initiatives like the AMR industry initiative when it comes to antimicrobials and PSCI, the pharmaceutical supply chain initiative. So, so there are strong programs in place and then there is a lot of, of uh, initiatives that addresses some of the, the concerns being raised, for instance, with like legacy products, the old products without, uh, without data, where we, uh, together with the European Commission under the IMI initiative, Innovative Medicines Initiative, are running a, a project called Premier, where we uh, try to identify where are the most important gaps that needs to be, be closed by, by, uh, by doing uh, environmental risk assessments for some of these old products that do not have the relevant uh, data sets. Uh, we'll probably come back to, to some of the other initiatives as well. So I pause there and leave that to you, Sean Christoph. Uh, I am. Thanks a lot, and uh, it's uh, it's nice to hear that uh, uh, that pharma that uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, is, uh, so, is susceptible uh, of this um, of this problem. So now uh, we'll uh, move to to some questions, and uh, I have uh, several questions from the panel uh, here. And uh, so the first one maybe. Uh, should be interesting. Uh, it's uh, maybe more technical aspects. Uh, so how we can uh, regulate the discharge of uh, antimicrobials from pharmaceutical production? Uh, because we, we don't have uh, any standard of uh, these chemicals or the metabolites. Maybe, uh, may, uh, I don't know who, who may uh, answer the, this question. And uh, maybe pa Patrick or Christophe, uh, do we have standard uh, for to, to monitoring uh, these uh, this, this antimicrobials pharmaceuticals. For me, we, are, we haven't standard now no. for, uh, for the management of uh, antimicrobial in environment. In France, for now we haven't uh, regulation, even in hospital, because one hotspot is a uh, discharge of hospital effluent, and we haven't, uh, except monitoring or surveillance process, processes, but we haven't uh, regulation yet. And uh, uh, an another technical uh, question is uh, how uh, endocrine disruptor can be assessed today? Uh, the, if there's new uh, inexpensive, is that an expensive method uh, to, to monitor this uh, endocrine disruptor? Uh, because the prime of the cost is uh, is important, actually. Uh, Jean-Yves, Jean, Jean maybe uh, if you have uh, any idea about the technical aspect of uh, endocrine. Yeah, th thank you. I think that might be a question for, for Patrick, who uh, mentioned the... Uh, uh, yeah. in these key aspects in his presentation. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know exactly the, the, the cost of the, the analysis. What I know is that the problem with the endocrine disruptors, and particularly when we are talking about uh, substances such as ethinylestradiol, is that the concentration is extremely low, is below the nanogram per, per liter, even uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, even 
within the, the femtogram per liter. So the, we, we are currently using uh, LCA MSMS uh, method for the detection. Uh, now I know that there are some ELISA tests and also some Calux uh, uh, tests that can be used. Uh, but if you want to have a very precise quantification, you have to use uh, chromatography coupled with uh, uh, MS, MS uh, method. Um, yeah, so th they are not so frequently analyzed in routine. Uh, I know that, for example, the, the company in Belgium uh, for the water supply, they are developing new tests to go at very low concentration. But I'm not a chemist, so maybe, but unfortunately, we, we lost uh, uh, Professor Sauvé, who is more involved in chemistry. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I believe uh, he, he couldn't stay uh, and uh, he, he left uh, or, or for Yeah, him. I know. And uh, in, in this context, uh, does the innovation, does the industry uh, made some innovation in green, uh, in green chemistry? Uh, is there some chem green chemistry solution uh, at, uh, in, the, in the industry? Uh, have you some example of new drugs? Yeah, but this is this is what I explain uh, at the end of my of my short talk. Uh, we are now working in collaboration with uh, Mitra Pharmaceuticals because they have developed uh, estetrol, is this E4 um, estrogen that is a natural estrogen. So when you are comparing with uh, etinylosodiol, uh, which is a synthetic one. So the, the persistence of etinylosodiol is, is very long and it's a very stable uh, compound, while usually the natural uh, estrogens are less persistent. And so what we have observed using a, a lot of experiment now, different, different stages with a, a fish, the zebra fish, that is a very good uh, toxicological model, is that uh, estetrol looks to be much less uh, endocrine disruptor than uh, the etinylosodiol. So I think that this is the, the future is also to produce chemicals that are more green for the environment um, with of course the same uh, bioactivity for the, for the target, uh, but that is less detrimental for the environment. And the, the result that we have that we are that we have obtained so far are, are really uh, interesting, and uh, we are very optimistic about that. So this is an example yeah. of yeah. the the solution that can be found probably upstream. So at the at the preparation development of new pharmaceuticals. And, um, maybe uh, Bengt, uh, uh, how can the, the environment uh, impact can be uh, minimized uh, at uh, each life cycle of the, of the medicine? Uh, is there some, uh, some programs? Yeah, well, there, there, there is a lot of work on this. And I mentioned this IMI premier project, talking about addressing some of the, the, uh, the old products without uh, environmental uh, full data sets. In that project, we're also looking into to, uh, uh, green design type of, of, uh, of work. And there has been, of course, uh, over the years, a lot of work in this area, but I just want to be, be uh, everyone should be very mindful that there is a lot of challenges in this, of course, that, that uh, uh, first of all, just to, to try to, to change the, the uh, a molecule, of course, would probably mean that the the, uh, the medical um, effects and and the pharmacology everything changes it would probably need it will need new new uh, clinical trials and and uh, registration and it'll be very challenging believe me if if we try to bring a greener drug green by design type of drug to the market uh, competing with some of the the old products that is already present in this therapeutic field with that are generically uh, available very very low 
prices for those products and you come in with an entirely new innovative drug, Greener, is there a willingness to pay for potentially a higher price for greenness by society? I think that needs to be taken into account. Uh, so so uh, there are, as, as Patrick uh, alludes to, some examples that, that could be looked into. Uh, but uh, I would still say there's a lot of challenges uh, for us when it comes to green design. I would rather say that we see much more opportunities uh, on a broad scale when it comes to what I call green manufacturing, not, not necessarily design of the molecules to make them biodegradable, for instance, but actually securing that uh, the manufacturing processes are, are as green as possible when it comes to choice of solvents, when it comes to using biocatalysts instead of, of metals and so on and so forth. But green by design on a molecular level is a challenge, but still we, we're working it, for instance, in the Premier project. Yeah, thank you. Um... Another key word I heard today is the education. And maybe one question for, for you, Sophia, but should we increase awareness and promote prudent use of pharmaceutical? I think the very short answer is yes, but I can, I can elaborate it a bit <laughs> because I think education and awareness actually are key words in, in this area. And, and patients has to be uh, involved and um, encouraged to, uh, for example, return your expired unused uh, medications uh, so they can be probably uh, prob appropriately disposed. Uh, and I think that is something that every every doctor can can talk with our patients mm. about, uh, and we can also encourage them to to uh, to um, responsible self care behaviors. For example, when it comes to antibiotics, you can have a discussion, and you can have uh, educational. Uh, campaigns, so to say, on a national level, how to when are, when you're supposed to use antibiotics and when you're not supposed to use antibiotics. Uh, so I think you can work with the patients and and of course, as, as a professional uh, clinician, you have to have a continuous professional development uh, so that you're always uh, on um, updated on, on research and, and good practices in minimizing uh, negative impact of, of medication. Uh, uh, another question for, for, for a medical doctor. Uh, we we uh, heard about uh, water, about uh, uh, pharmaceutical use, but one question was uh, about the, the view of uh, uh, hair contamination. Uh, uh, what, what are the view of asthma on COPD patients' medicine needs of inhalers containing F gases that contribute to the greenhouse, greenhouse emissions? So is, is there uh, um, important hair contamination by pharmaceutical too? I think I have to let that question to somebody who works in that field because that is not my, <laughs> my competence field. So perhaps some of the other panelists is able to, to help me with an answer. Yeah, if somebody has an answer about uh, contamination of hair because we're uh, in the environment pollution and we didn't spoke uh, a lot uh, about hair. Maybe Jean-Yves, Jean maybe you have a... Uh, an idea if, if there is a, a lot of compounds, uh, is it possible to, to monitor uh, contamination uh, into the air? So it's, it's really difficult to have access to data of um, contamination in, in wastewater. So it's increasingly more difficult to have access to data in, in air. But I think the answer should be, should be yes. The extent, um, at the best of my knowledge, is unknown. But we know that the pharmaceutical industry significantly contributes to, uh, to climate change. Um, it is more. Um, it has a biggest impact on, on on climate change than the automotive industry, for instance. Uh, and we know there are um, massive. Uh, there's a big groove uh, of improvement from the pharmaceutical sectors. Some pharmaceutical companies are already taking the lead on this, uh, and we've seen a lot of commitments to reach uh, net zero in the in the coming years. So uh, now we are waiting to see whether the words can be you know translated into acts. Um, and, and we can really um, have a significant drop in, in the, the, the impact of, uh, of pharmaceutical production 
uh, on the environment and, and climate change developments. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, another question uh, uh, I've seen uh, about uh, the veterinary aspects, uh, maybe for this point uh, from the Veterinary uh, Association. Uh, do you think that the environmental impact assessment currently required for veterinary medical products uh, is fit for purposes? Uh, you, you have talked about uh, several programs on interesting measures already, uh, already done for veterinary medicine, but uh, is it, uh, is it enough or have you another, uh, um, uh, another assessment uh, to, to propose? Yes, thank you for uh, this question. Um, indeed, enough, it's a word that you cannot really quantify, but uh, what I can say is that uh, indeed the veterinary medicines before entering the EU market uh, they pass a very rigorous assessment. As I said, this is a, 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 a two-stage assessment. All veterinary medicines, when applied for authorization as part of their normal process, they have to, uh, to pass this environmental risk assessment to ensure that there is no potential risk for the environment. Uh, either from the use of the medicine or from the environmental exposure to this medicine. If the, uh, the, this product, uh, this uh, molecule does not show any uh, risk, it can be granted the, the normal uh, uh, authorization. If uh, a potential risk is identified, then it has to go into a more uh, deep investigation to look into environmental degradation, to look into effects that these products may have on terrestrial and aquatic, not targeted organisms, in order to better characterize the risk. And after the second phase uh, assessment, uh, of course, we can uh, find a possibility that no exist, no uh, unacceptable risk exists and the product can be granted authorization, uh, or it can be identified that we can in indicate and um, uh, implement some uh, uh, mitigation measures uh, in order to, to control the uh, side effects. And uh, in that case, the, the product is authorized and these warnings are mandatory. They have to be implemented. Uh, the veterinarians have a role to advise and to uh, ensure that the, the user uh, will uh, follow these instructions. And in case that the risk, it, it cannot be acceptable, it's an important risk for the environment, then the product does not uh, enter in the market. And all these, uh, they are, now regulated also with the new uh, veterinary medicines regulation, which additionally includes a next step after authorization, and this has to do with pharmacovigilance. So uh, veterinary pharmacovigilance include also the aspect of environment, environmental adverse events. So we can say that we have a quite a very robust framework, at least here in Europe, that I, I can speak about. Uh, to ensure as much as possible uh, that we uh, mitigate uh, the, the environmental pollution and uh, uh, poisoning. And maybe I take the opportunity to say um, that uh, uh, ensuring our environment, uh, that we are not polluting or poisoning our environment, this is a true One Health approach. Actually, we're contributing through that to animal and human health. And this is an important uh, note for all of us to take, I think. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you Despana. Uh, uh, I have a question, uh, maybe for a uh, member of the European uh, uh, com uh, Commission. Uh, who is responsible, actually? Uh, pharma or patients? Uh, who will organize, uh, for example, uh, the, collecting, uh, the collecting of uh, unused medicine or uh, some, some um, program like that? Uh, maybe Hans or... 
who is um, responsible? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, when it is about the collection of uh, pharmaceutical waste, uh, as far as I know, waste policy is not really my field, but uh, we have either recommendations or even legislation that says that member states need to set up uh, separate collection systems through pharmacies um, of unused uh, pharm pharmaceuticals. Um, I know that this is very much the uh, system here in Belgium, for instance, where you're supposed to bring back your unused uh, pharmaceuticals to the to the pharmacy and then they uh, take care of uh, further processing. I think incineration is the normal uh, route for that. Huh? So not uh, I, I don't see what else you could do with it. So I think that kind of way gets gets incinerated. Uh, that, that's but, that's all I know. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so in, in this context, uh, which policy instruments uh, can be implemented to control uh, pharmaceutical in the environment? That's, uh, or what, what type of uh, in policy instrument uh, could be well, done? Well, when it comes to waste, it's what I just described. Huh? So that's then the waste policy, the waste uh, legislation that we have in place. Um, um, and then uh, when it comes to active well uh, pharmaceutical uh, residues in water um, it's what i said in my my intervention there are various uh, pieces of legislation that work in that area the wastewater treatment is the most important one i guess um, there we are hoping to change the legislation in such a way that not only uh, more water gets treated in the first place, but also that we, well, at least we're considering a mechanism to make sure that uh, the polluter pays in that area, because it would be somewhat unfair if the general taxpayer would pay for uh, a pollution where someone uh, is, is clearly earning money somewhere down the line or, or upstream, uh, rather. Um, so that's urban wastewater treatment. Then, of course, we have the legislation on surface water quality, um, where we are hoping to uh, update a list of pharmaceutical products that are uh, to be regulated by member states. Um, and, and if all goes well, we will come with a proposal in, in September on that. Um, and when it comes to the industry, or rather, uh, but also uh, uh, at farm level, there is the industrial emissions directive that we have in place to regulate um, industrial processes and um, plant level uh, emissions uh, subject to make them subject to permitting and, and that permitting should then help to, um, to reduce the emissions at the level of individual industrial installations or uh, large farms. At least that's what we want in the future. Uh, th thank you. Uh, we won't have time to, uh, to, to, uh, to speak about all questions. Uh, we have just uh, maybe one last, uh, uh, because the, the environmental the water pollution is a uh, uh, is an important uh, aspect, maybe for Christophe or uh, Jean-Yves. Uh, how can we improve, insensitive or encourage uh, waste on wastewater treatment to remove pharmaceutical residue? Uh, well, what what could what could be done uh, actually uh, with a, a low cost, maybe uh, low cost uh, strategy to uh, avoid uh, pharmaceutical residues into the environment? Uh, um, maybe Jean Christophe, I can uh, I can just give some information uh, before Jean Yves if we have time. Uh, I know that, for example, in Belgium there are some companies that are developing new uh, component that can be placed, for example, directly at the effluents from hospitals, and using uh, active uh, carbon uh, to to remove 
a, a lot of these uh, pharmaceuticals before then the effluents are going to traditional uh, sewage treatment plants. Uh, but as I mentioned before, technically, and I think it, it was said also by other speakers, technically you can remove everything or all the compounds you want. It's just a question of cost. Uh, are we ready to pay much more to get uh, the water from, from the tap? Because when you are paying for the water at, at the tap, you are not paying for the, uh, the drinking water, you are paying for the, the cleaning of the used water. This is the main cost. Um, and I'm not sure that at the moment, uh, based on the, the data that we have on hand, it is uh, realistic uh, and relevant to go until such uh, huge treatment, very costly. Uh, I think that that's all the options to, to reduce from the source, either by changing some formulation, by reducing also the consumption, by collecting, harvesting the, 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 the use or the, the, the expired uh, pharmaceuticals, etc. But there are some techniques and uh, that seems to be uh, feasible, but not for the whole water, uh, use water, but mainly for some specific effluents. And just to finish, and I will give the, the floor to the others, uh, don't forget that most of the sewage treatment plant are also collecting rainwater. There is no separation between the used water and the rainwater. And it's very costly, of course, to completely change the canalization in order to collect only the used water. And this is, of course, a limitation also. Yes, just, just a, quick, a quick answer. Um, you, you, you have to propose also a national tax, like in Switzerland, to implement a treatment system in a 100 wastewater treatment plant. And I think in, in Switzerland is a nine or 10 euro, no, not euro, it's a franc, uh, for each person to implement this wastewater, this uh, tertiary treatment in the biggest uh, wastewater treatment plant. So it's a political choice. It, it, it technically, it's, uh, it's easy to do. Not easy, but it's possible to do. The problem is after you, um, you reject in the, um, in the environment, um, potable water. It's look like potable water except the disinfection. So it's a political choice, an environmental choice. If I can complement as well, I think. Yeah, I'm... just one word. On, uh, yeah, I just would like to, to echo what uh, uh, Patrick has been saying. I think he made a, made a really good point here. I think uh, upgrading with photo treatment plants is, is very um, energy intensive and is very costly. So that's why um, the OECD published a report on pharmaceutical residues in fresh water in 2019, in which they say that we need to focus first on source directed and use oriented approaches. And then end of pipe techniques can be used, but only in complementary to source directed and user oriented approaches. First, we need to prevent pollution and we need to be able to uh, remove pharmaceutical residues when all these um, upstream approach have, have been taken. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Yves, uh, everybody. Just uh, to, two minutes to, to conclude this uh, very interesting forum. And so many thanks to, to all the speakers uh, for having responded and uh, for their investment and the quality of, uh, uh, of their intervention. Uh, this uh, talk uh, testified to the extent of the field concerned by the pharmaceutical production in uh, the environment and uh, that were indeed in the one health problem. And uh, actually two hours are uh, clearly not enough to be exhausted. Uh, some speakers have uh, been able to show uh, that uh, the, this pollution has a strong impact in the ecosystems and also constitute a health risk such as uh, emergence of AMR or synergistic uh, effect of uh, some drugs uh, on different uh, organisms like fish or other. Uh, very interestingly, uh, awareness is obviously present among doctors, pharmacists, veterinarians, uh, scientists, uh, industrialists, and politicians. And that's a very good news. And uh, I have a few key words came to mind during this forum. And the first one is uh, that uh, water treatment and management uh, with high concentration of drug is, uh, is important. 
and uh, it's echoed with a PNS paper recently published uh, about the uh, contamination of more than 200 rivers and showing that the, the, the most contaminated site, sites are those with uh, uh, little or no domestic wastewater treatment systems and also from pharmaceutical uh, industry. Uh, so we can also mention uh, that the problem of uh, medicine waste disposal on packaging, but I noticed that some uh, way of research are uh, uh, very interesting, such as uh, uh, ecotoxicology of a pharmaceutical mixture, the fate of compounds, uh, uh, especially uh, about uh, metabolisms that are more present than, uh, than original compounds. Uh, that's uh, very interesting and uh, needs to be, uh, to, to be um, looked. Uh, our participants also have open interesting perspectives such as uh, legal tools, especially for environment risk assessment, uh, transparency, and uh, to be more eco-friendly by the more to, to make more greener pharmacy and greener medicine. Uh, education and training uh, is uh, very important on promoting best practices uh, is crucial. Uh, so uh, it's a term of uh, Dr. Madsen. I, I think it's an eco pharmaco stewardship uh, approach uh, that has been uh, engaged and uh, is, con uh, is on concerned uh, really everyone in this uh, one else uh, approach. I would like to thank all the members of the team, uh, its president, Stefan, as well as the organiza organizers, uh, Patrick, uh, Elisa, uh, Ruben. And uh, please note that uh, this uh, forum uh, has been recorded and will be available uh, on YouTube in a few days and a summary will be also published. So thank you very much for being so much to be present today and um, see you soon. Thank you all very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Okay. Bye.